As Africans, we need to generate and preserve our own narratives, utilizing our diversity and generational strengths to drive regional development and unity. The series is especially for front runners, young change makers, content creators, and innovators to be more informed and empowered to portray and provoke society. We went in depth to understand decolonizing nationalism, unravel self-censorship, and explore AI threatened or empowered through the lenses of Dr. Alexander Rosero, Dr. Sishua Sishua, and award-winning techpreneur Sam Masakini. When we are talking about decolonizing nationalism, it is important to bring the two intertwined aspects of our decolonization as well as that of nationalism. Decolonization itself is a conscious movement that did not start now, but I must say which has gained much traction in the contemporary uh, than any other time. Decolonization started as early as pre-1900s following the heinous slave trade that captured indigenous people from their territories, from their land, shipped to the global north, the Americas, Europe, and all over. So they were, they were calls by those people at that early stage calling for their emancipation, calling for the abandonment of slave trade because it was degrading, uh, it was also deprovincializing and deterritorializing de people from their entire territories. So you find that there were the likes of Amakas Gavi who were calling for the repatriation of Africans, for example, back home. There were calls from the likes of a Dubois who were also calling for issues of a recognizing the black color as a bona fide uh, human race. But in the contemporary, the discourses of decolonization are focusing on the consciousness, intellectual consciousness. And the critical argument is that colonialism or colonization is not over but it is all over so in the current context you would realize that decolonization focuses mainly on three realms say uh, which denotes to issues of uh, the physical empire which was dealt with with the, the coming of independence of almost all states from the global south but there are also the remnants when the physical empire left the colonial encroachment uh, became invisible but manifested in two other critical aspects. The first one is the epistemological landscape. By the epistemological landscape, we are making reference to the knowledge system. And the argument of the knowledge system is that normally what we perceive as reality is shaped by the knowledge that we have. Philosophically, we are saying epistemology frames or informs ontology. So the knowledge system of the entire Global South has been dealt with a heavy blow because the Global North's epistemology remains the normative and the rest is an alternative. So in our disciplines, for example, international relations or sociology, etc., they are always godfathers and those godfathers they are not people we can resonate with people who come from africa or the entire global global south meaning that africa has never been perceived as a place that can produce knowledge yet decolonization it advocates for what is called the locus of enunciation meaning knowledge can be produced contextually to an environment one is so that's epistemology. So African epistemologies and the rest of Global South is epistemology. By Global South, I am making reference outside Africa to, to the regions such as Latin America, the regions are such as Asia, etc. So they underwent a process which is called epistemicide. That is the deliberate destruction of their knowledge system to the extent that 
there is no African knowledge system prior to its conduct with the West. There is no global South knowledge system prior to its conduct with the West. So apart from epistemicide, we also suffered uh, what is called linguicide. So up to now, we still identify ourselves as a Francophone, Anglophone, uh, Lusophone, etc. We have an attachment of language to our estuar uh, colonizers to the extent that in certain instances, some states do not know even their languages prior to their contact uh, with the colonizers. I will give you Mozambique as a region uh, to, to, to consider in that respect to the extent that they, there has been a, a deliberate erosion of the history, the language, the memory of what Mozambique was prior to its conduct with the Portuguese Empire. But more importantly, the Global South has also suffered from cognitive uh, dismantling. So even the way we have conditioned to think, the way we have been conditioned to imagine, the way we have been conditioned to innovate, somewhere, somehow, we has got some colonial attachments. So briefly, this is what decolonization as a crusade, as an intellectual movement, is seeking to debunk. In addition to the current realities of the hierarchicalization, of our states, the hierarchicalization of human beings in a pyramid, where our ontological skin density of the black color up to now is still being questioned. The process of us becoming, the process of us being human beings, it's still being questionable to the extent that we are more closely associated to less beings or partial beings. Why? Because the process of slave trade that was followed by another process of physical colonization of the empire. It completed the whole entire process of dehumanizing the black color. So if the black color is not regarded as a human being, he cannot have rights because human rights are only rights that are entitled to humans. So there is this fallacy of the universalization of human rights because within that space, other people are still being denied their right to become human. So we are yet to undergo a process of becoming, a process of becoming human beings. So having said that, I move to nationalism. So the discourses of nationalism are generally attached to the idea of a nation state the collective understanding of a people in a given territory to have shared identity shared culture and more importantly autonomy to preside over the territory that they call theirs so there is an intricate linkage between issues of our nationalism and issues of our sovereignty but when you are Coming to issues now of decolonizing nationalism, the unfortunate part is that 57 or so years after independence of the first African states, the likes of uh, Sudan, which was the first followed by Ghana, etc., there has not been a process of a decolonization which makes an African state a bona fide decolonial state. So the African state is still an idea. So if the African state is still an idea, nationalism in Africa is also still an idea. We saw the pursuit of nationalism which inspired the taking of arms, guns, uh, to confront the physical empire in the 1960s, ending in the 1980s, uh, 1990s with the likes of Namibia also becoming independent. But what is important is that the holistic understanding of decolonizing nationalism can only meaningfully take place if we come to terms with the reality that the African state is still pretty much a colonial state. So you do not talk of nationalism in a colonial state. So what we were given at independence 
where flags, new flags, new national anthems are black administrators, but the colonial edifices, the colonial architecture, the colonial system remained much the same to the extent that the current president in Africa is still a colonial clerk. So when we have states of Africa which are still colonial states presided over colonial by colonial cliques, we cannot talk of a nationalism in Africa. Yes, nationalism drove a movement that brought independence, but what happened after? What happened after was that the African state was presided by a petite bourgeois who indulged in a, pol a process of colonial mimicry. So the very same treatment that the natives were, 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 were treated by the colonial empire remains the very treatment today leading us to the conviction that the African state is still colonial. So when we want to decolonize nationalism, the first thing that should die is the tribe because a nation should supersede, should supplant, should preside over a tribe over a tribe but in africa we actually have a reverse there is the rise of the tribe and the death of the nation to the extent that the nation is currently facing an existential threat that existential threat manifests from the statesmen who are presiding over African states who have renewed the forms of neo-patrimonialism. They appoint their children as ministers, they appoint their children as vice presidents. The similar behavior that took place during the physical colonial occupation and this validates the emphasis that the African state is still colonial. So if we want to decolonize nationalism, the first soft target is the tribe. A nation can only thrive when the tribe uh, has died. The second target is actually the current political leader in Africa who is still a colonial clerk. We must have an African leader or a Global South leader who has got love for his people because the collective idea of identity and the sense of belonging can only emanate when you have a leadership that loves people. When you love your nation, you jealously guard the natural resources. You do not mortgage them in one way or the other as has been the case with almost all global South leaders who enter into deals that are short of mortgaging natural resources to the extent that future generations will find shells masquerading as states. This has been the greatest shortcoming. The leader that we have in Africa does not have love for the nation because he or she is for the umpteenth time a colonial clerk. So we must get rid of the colonial architecture first before we think of decolonizing nationalism. Because if we get rid of the colonial architecture, we will realize the need of collective being. So colonialism dealt a great deal in dehumanizing the colonized, vanquishing the colonized. And this has not taken place after independence because the deal of independence was an unfinished business. We need a, a, a post-colonial leader who engages in a program of rehumanizing uh, the being, rehumanizing the African, rehumanizing the black. And this has not taken place. What has happened is the continued dehumanization of blacks by fellow blacks. And we have since entered the affairs of what I call native colonialism. So whereas in, during the physical empire occupation, we had the settler colonialism, people coming from certain geographies occupying us and colonizing us. We now have black colonizers presiding over their own natives. And what is manifested 
is native colonialism, which explains the predatory politics that we currently have, characterizing Africa and the entire global south. If there is no deliberate action to jealously guard resources for the common good of the nation, what it means is that it's simply a manifestation of native colonialism. So we can only decolonize nationalism if we come to terms to reality that we are still colonies, that the phase of confronting the physical empire was just but one epoch of the grand scheme of dealing with all the targets, the knowledge system, the cognitive, the lingual, as well as the entire ontological and epistemological framework that has remained one tilted in favor of the global north. Uh, it, the expense and disadvantage of the global south. So self-censorship is an important uh, subject in Southern Africa and uh, across the continent more generally. Uh, it refers to a situation where individuals choose not to say something, usually as a result of um, uh, external pressure, uh, but also sometimes because what is to be said contradicts that individual's belief, especially for those who are involved in uh, the promotion of human rights. The, the most widespread form of self-censorship that is known relates to uh, the area of uh, political and civil rights. In countries like Zimbabwe, in Zambia, and Malawi, you find many people choosing not to comment on uh, government policies or the actions of the leadership in power because they fear the consequences. Uh, speaking against government officials, for example, can lead, can lead, can lead you to can lead to your arrest, and uh, you can even lose opportunities in relation to jobs. So people tend to um, uh, keep quiet, even on issues where they should be speaking, because the law, for example, provides for uh, the freedom of expression. It's a more, it's a a much more widespread form of self censorship that is known, especially under authoritarian regimes. But uh, there is another form of self censorship, I think, that uh, relates mainly to discussion around the rights of sexual minorities. And here, it doesn't matter whether one in is Zimbabwe or Zambia or Malawi, uh, the attitude towards the rights of sexual minorities is the same. <clears throat> it's a situation where individuals, for example, choose not to discuss uh, this topic um, because uh, they fear the social consequences of being seen as associated with the uh, promotion of the rights of sexual minorities. Uh, even those who work in civil society who um, identify themselves as human rights defenders. They don't discuss uh, or rather defend and protect the rights of sexual minorities because uh, society sees the issue of homosexuality as a Western agenda. Uh, but some of the human rights uh, uh, institutions, rather individuals, uh, are Christians who think that he, uh, heterosexualism is the only form of sexuality that is uh, accepted. So, to the extent that uh, defending the rights of sexual minorities contradicts uh, their own religious beliefs, they self-censor. Um, and then you have um, politicians uh, who also tend to Fear the consequences, you know, voters are likely to punish you at the polls if they see you as a politician who is a, 
uh, in support of the right of sexual minorities. So they pander to the interest of the conservative majority by um, uh, hoisting homophobic sentiment or the idea that uh, you know homosexuals are people who are who need medical help rather than accepting their orientation as natural. Even the media, you know, they don't promote the, any discussion of the right of sexual minorities because they live in these societies where the majority of the population uh, holds homophobic sentiment and is not prepared to discuss uh, the issue of uh, the right of sexual minorities. So self-censorship happens at different levels, at the individual level, at the, the level of the media, uh, at the level of government leaders and uh, politicians, but also at the individual level. Uh, I had an experience in Zambia recently myself. I wrote um, uh, an opinion piece uh, that examined this issue of sexual minorities uh, to understand the foundation of the uh, people who are opposed to this discussion. I submitted it to a leading private newspaper in Zambia, uh, but the editors chose not to publish it because they say they were not prepared to publish this topic because it's very controversial and uh, they don't want the backlash from society. So you can see that even in instances where the individual is willing uh, to discuss uh, this kind of uh, uncomfortable subject, the platforms which should serve as our vehicles for speaking to each other uh, engage in self-censorship, which is sad because when you look at the legal architecture that uh, outlaws homosexuality in countries like Zambia, in countries like Malawi, in countries like Zimbabwe, it's the same. Usually, uh, the provision would say uh, uh, would, would outlaw sex outside the order of nature. Now, who is an authority on nature? What is the order of nature? Uh, if it is um, led to sexual positions, I don't think that um, sexual positions should be legislated. They should be left to the creativity of the individuals involved. Uh, and how, how is the police going to enforce such a law anyway? It would mean they will have to go to their homes, private homes, to find out how individuals, what kind of social position individuals are engaged in under the covers. Um, that, that violates the right of privacy. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that uh, many people uh, entertain is that sexual minorities, um, you know, choose to be gay, choose to be lesbians. Uh, but that's not true. Why would someone choose to be gay or lesbian in a society where a majority of the population is opposed to that choice? It's natural. And uh, um, I don't see personally, uh, uh, while I am heterosexual, I do not support homophobia against the, uh, sexual minorities because as a historian, I do know that we had sexual minorities even in pre-colonial Africa, long before the advent of uh, European colonialism. These people existed among us. Um, so it's not something that uh, comes from outside, like Christianity, for example. You could actually say Christianity is... Um, a foreign import now masquerading as an indigenous tradition, just like homophobia itself, because, because homosexuality existed uh, within our pre-colonial African societies. What I think uh, is needed is internal discussions within our societies to ask ourselves difficult questions like, uh, how do I, as a third party, suffer are the result of uh, two adults um, consensually having uh, a some sexual relationship? In what way am I affected as a third party? 
Um, if you look at it from that perspective, you discover that the foundation of much of the homophobia that we exhibit towards those whose sexual orientation is different from our own is rooted in prejudice. And the, um, what is needed, I think, is uh, outlawing, rather decriminalizing the law that uh, outlaws homosexuality and allowing society to evolve on the basis of um, um, social attitudes uh, to, um, to have a situation where we can discuss issues of sexuality without uh, looking at them as, you know, a Western agenda. I think what hasn't helped is that uh, Western countries, especially in recent years, have arrived on the uh, on the African continent with prescriptions to say if you don't um, promote the interests of sexual minorities as uh, a government in office, uh, we are going to reduce funding or aid uh, to your country. That that is counterproductive because it has connotations of an imperial agenda. Uh, you still have so many people who are homophobic, even in developed societies like uh, the United States, United Kingdom, and others. I uh, used to have people who uh, retain pride for bigotry. Um, uh, what I think is needed is to allow African countries, uh, ourselves, to, to discuss these issues openly so that whatever is agreed at the end is a product of local rather than external dynamics. But for that to happen, we have to be prepared to re-examine what we regard as normal, uh, to ask ourselves difficult questions, to say, if he, um, uh, the, the, our position to homosexuality rests on the idea that I don't want to see a woman kissing a fellow a woman or a man kissing a fellow man. It's not like homosexuality. Homosexuals conduct their sexual activities in public. Like those of us who are heterosexuals, they conduct their sexual affairs in private. Anyone who does, um, you know, who conducts their sexual activities in public uh, is arrested because there are, there are laws that deal sufficiently with that. So how does a private uh, consensual sex between um, two adults affect me as an individual. Um, when we re-examine some of these uh, discussions away from this notion that this is a Western agenda, uh, you may find that uh, we are not uh, without justification in relation to the discrimination that we demonstrate against uh, our brothers and sisters uh, who identify uh, as homosexuals or who have a different sexual orientation from our own. But we need uh, everybody to join the discussion. And by everybody, I don't mean outsiders like Western governments, uh, Western actors telling us what we should do. But I'm referring to uh, African human rights defenders um, uh, themselves to rise above their, um, their you know, prejudices they are constraints informed by faith because we, um, we betray our conscience and our duty of care to one another. The moment we decide um, which human rights to defend and which one to ignore. Uh, human rights are due to people on the basis of their humanity, um, not the, uh, what we decide as individuals or as societies. You know, it's sad because at one time, uh, black people were regarded as less human, and that <coughs> not even found expression in the law. Uh, uh, um, uh, then that changed. Um, then women were regarded as less human on the basis of their gender. That changed. Um, today, we look down upon people of different sexual orientation as less human. Among the, uh, the culprits who are, who are looking down upon homosexuals 
are those who were regarded as less human yesterday because they were black, uh, because they were women. Um, we dehumanize ourselves the moment we start thinking of other people as less human. And I think it's very, very important that we discuss this, this issue uh, openly. The self-censorship that we um, tend to uh, engage in as individuals, uh, as governments, as, the, um, uh, as media institutions must stop. And what is needed is open discussion of very uncomfortable subjects such as sexuality, so that at the end of it all, uh, we don't have a scenario where because we have self-censored, the person who comes from outside uh, and begins to talk about sexuality becomes a reference point for a subject to say, you go away, we don't want to discuss these things because we have self-censored. There are, there are people who um, have a different sexual orientation from our own in our region. And it's important that we don't ignore this subject. It's important that we, we remain open and that we call for the decriminalization of our, our homosexuality laws. Because many of the, these laws were, were, were colonial accidents. They, were, they arrived here during the colonial period uh, when the British were still in charge of Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. Um, and yet the British themselves have even abandoned these laws. They have decriminalized them. For us, we have still, we have still kept them uh, on our statutes. It is time to decriminalize uh, anti-homosexuality laws. It's time to uh, stop the self-censorship that we engage in on difficult subjects such as sexuality. I think machine learning and artificial intelligence can play a very big part in our economy itself. Um, a good example would be, imagine if we used artificial intelligence to detect early cancer cells. Um, this could be a very, uh, you know, a huge, a huge um, advantages point if you look at it, how under-resourced as a country we are and so many African nations. Another good example would be, we had Cyclone Freddy and we were heavily affected with some other neighboring countries. So much information, weather, is flowing around us. With artificial intelligence, we can be able to utilize that kind of information to come with particular models that can, for example, be able to do early detection of such events before they even occur. So it doesn't come as a very huge surprise, would at least be at a level of readiness. Another part is you still use artificial intelligence to be able to uh, manage relief responses, seeing, you know, there's just so much information, uh, relief, uh, the donor community, uh, the ones that have been affected, all that information was literally being gathered. But because of the level of intellect, uh, because of the gap in, in, in the digital divide gap, you'd find out that we're not fully utilizing artificial intelligence to its capacity. But when you look at it, it's one of the biggest enablers to our economy and our well-being as well. So there are a lot of people that are afraid that artificial intelligence is going to take their jobs. There are certain times and certain uh, positions that artificial intelligence just fits so well. There could be certain positions uh, in, in government that require machines to do because you being a human fact there, uh, all of a sudden you become a target. And we've seen this multiple times happening. I, for one, do believe that given enough time, we can be able to uptake the opportunity that artificial intelligence does give us. And with, with, with enough resources, we can be able to set a footprint in the digital landscape of a country and, and, and the, the entire continent. And I believe that someday that is definitely going to be possible. We have a lot to learn and unlearn. So inviting masterminds in academia and innovation is critical to disrupting and deconstructing our understanding of these perspectives. 